like you like to welcome you here to the mouth of the Forge River on October 19th and we're in Mastic, New York. The reason we're here at the Forge River is because this is part of the Day in the Life of the River program that we've had for the last seven or eight years. But given the pandemic and the fact that schools are not allowing teachers to take students out on field trips, what we decided to do was take our panel of experts and do the activities that the students would do and then send all the data on a video to the teachers and the classes so they can then analyze the data. So what I'd like to do at this point is introduce our experts so you know who we're working with here. My name is Mel Morris. I work at Brookhaven National Laboratory in the Office of Education, and I'm one of the co-creators of the Day in the Life of the River program. Hi, I'm Melissa Perrott with the Central Pine Barrens Commission and also one of the co-creators of this amazing program. I'm Ron Gillardi with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. I'm an environmental educator. Hello, I'm Aleida Perez from Brookhaven National Laboratory. Welcome. Yeah, g'day all. My name's Alan Duckworth. I work for the town of Brookhaven as an environmental analyst. I am George Costa and I've been a member of Trout Unlimited here on Long Island for almost 30 years. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, we're starting group one. We're doing physical data. Uh, first off, we're going to look at the tides. Now, the tides are caused by the gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun. Uh, when they combine together, you get the, the largest tides of the month, those are the spring tides. When they work or oppose each other, you get the smallest tides of the year, those are the neap tides. So we're doing a very simple tide experiment where we're putting in flags every 10 minutes and from that you can work out whether the tide is falling or whether it's rising. If you look down here, we started this, we put this flag in almost 20 minutes ago. This one about 10 minutes ago. So you can see that the tide is falling, the water is moving out of the Forge River, heading towards the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, g'day again. We're back looking at the tides. This is the last final flag that we're putting in. This has been after 30 minutes since the first flag was put in. Put it in here. So that rep represents 30 minutes of tidal change. So we're going to measure the distance now from the first to the second flag and it is 51 centimeters. To the third flag it is one meter and two centimeters. So 102 centimeters to the fourth and final flag, it is one meter and 37 centimeters. So 137 centimeters. So one thing we need to remember about this falling tide is we're looking at how the tide changes along the beach. We're not looking, we, have, we did not measure the change in height of the actual tide, which is the, the vertical distance. We just looked at the, at the horizontal distance between the flags. So next up is current direction and speed. The direction will be marked by a piece of citrus that we're throwing out in the water. The citrus is bright orange, so it'll be noticeable. It floats and it is biodegradable, so we don't have to retrieve it. We could let it go wherever it's going to go on its infinite journey. Melissa will throw the orange out into the water and stand there. The current will carry the orange and after 60 seconds we will mark the linear distance along the beach that the orange traveled. Then we can calculate how far it travels in a minute and then even in miles per hour. Okay. 
so now we're going to do the air temperature. We are going to check the air temperature once every hour for three hours to get the average. So right now, our first check is on this glorious day on the Forge River is, I'm gonna say it is 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, we're going to take a few minutes now to discuss the uh, weather today here at uh, Osprey Point. I wish you all could be here. It turned out to be a fantastic day. Uh, there's a lot of cloud cover, roughly about 75% cloud cover, but the sun is still shining through some of the lighter clouds. So hello everybody. So we're going to now measure our wind. Uh, we, we're going to use this tool called the anemometer. As you can tell, you can see it has these little blades and how fast or how slow those blades go. It gives an idea of how the speed of the wind at this time. In addition to the wind, we will also we will be able to collect the, the air temperature at the time we are actually collecting our data for wind speed. So I'm placing my anemometer right above my shoulder. Our wind speed is 5.3 miles per hour, right? So that's our wind speed. Uh, when we're looking at the wind direction, the wind direction uh, can tell us when the wind is hitting our face, okay? So we know that our wind direction is an east-southeast wind, and we know that because now we can see that flag that is pointing that way that is heading northwest. Okay. Now, if we look at the water, water does not come. So I will say that the water is a ripple effect to that water. Okay. Wind speed from your anemometer at your school, make sure that you can fit that into the buffer scale. I'm going to talk a little bit about the area that we're in to get here on Long Island Osprey Park. I remember being at the site when I was maybe seven years old the first time, which is 1953. And from 1953 to now, it has changed quite a bit. Uh, I'm sure some of your parents will notice a lot of change as they've been getting on with their ages also. I'm going to give you some interesting facts about this area. Do you know that where we're standing on right now might look like a great beach? But maybe some 10 to 12,000 years ago, this area had almost several thousand feet of ice above my head. Long Island was covered with a glacial formation. Most of the United States and most of North, most of North America was covered by ice. As it receded, it drew back towards the North Shore, North, and eventually it became into this beach that you see now. Of course, the beach didn't look like this. It was far different. Hi, so now we want to talk a little bit about the physical characteristics of our site. As we look around at the site, we see that it's a sandy beach. Now, this is a remnant of a beach that used to be out another 30 or 40 feet. And this is what's left. And in order to protect the beach, the town has built a ramp or a walkway with uh, the docking out there that people use for fishing. It's sparsely vegetated. As you get closer to the shoot, to the parking lot, there's more vegetation, phragmites, grasses, uh, and beach grass. It's, it's a sandy beach, it's not pebbly. There's a few little pebbles here and there. And there are some remnants of bulkheads that were here from the past. One other characteristic that we're interested in is the bottom of the river, in this case, the Forge River. If we take a look at this, I'm going to walk out a little bit. We can see that the bottom is fairly sandy close to the shore. I'm not sure how it is when we go out, it's like 10 or 20 feet, but it's pretty much a sandy bottom. There's a lot of vegetation, but that vegetation is loose and has been blown in, I think, from the winds and the currents. So that's, really, that's one of the important measurements is, is to know where is the site in time and space. So in order to do that, we need to know the latitude and the longitude. And we can use Google Earth, and that gives us a pretty close approximation of latitude and longitude. But the nice thing you can do about that, since you're not here in person to see the site, is when you plug it into Google Maps or Google Earth, we get an, you get an aerial picture of the site, and then you can use that to draw your map of this particular site. 
Now what we're going to do is try to get a sediment core. I've got a couple of very simple tools. I have a plastic tube, a piece of wood we found here on the beach to protect the top so I don't smash it with this rubber hammer. I'm gonna step a few feet out and uh, drive this into the sediment. If I'm lucky, this will go down a little bit. I'll be able to wiggle it out and we'll have some sediment in, in here to analyze. So the total length of the core is 275 millimeters. So oxidized and anoxic. It is close to anoxic right off the top. So we have an anoxic layer and then an oxidized layer and an anoxic layer and then an oxidized layer. Cool. I don't know how to explain that. Can I take it separately? Sure. So the top one is about probably about to here. Yeah. About 120 centimeters. That's anoxics? Yeah. 120 millimeters. I'm sorry, millimeters. And then here's our next zone. Sorry. Our next one is maybe 75 millimeters. 75 is good. And then the other anoxic region, which is not as dark. This maybe. is the oxidized layer, right? Yeah. Okay. And the other one, the, the other anoxic layer, about 40? About 40 millimeters. The, the second anoxic layer is 40. And then the final layer is another 70. So a lot of the sand that's in here is this black, thick, um, dark coloration. This is from a type of bacteria that doesn't need oxygen to thrive. Instead, it lives in what we call an anoxic or oxygen-free environment. Its byproduct, instead of carbon dioxide, like most living organisms, uh, is hydrogen sulfide. And it gives a rotten egg smell that gives marshes that powerful uh, stench that happens when you walk through it. Uh, also, it tends to uh, stain the surrounding areas. So sometimes you'll see rocks or shells that will be blackened in color because of this hydrogen sulfide. So uh, to get an idea of what this is composed of, I'm gonna have to sort of work my way through it, which will also stain my fingers. I would say sand is very abundant. There's no mud, no clay. There's no shells that I see, but I'm gonna rinse it out just in case. There's sort of pea-sized gravel, maybe up to the size of grapes. So let me give it a rinse. No gold either. <laughs> Look at this cloud I'm making. No, no shell fragments at all. It's just uh, some small stones uh, from half a pea size, like a lentil perhaps, uh, on up to grape size. We're going to try to catch some organisms. This is going to be hopefully fish and invertebrates that live here in the river. We're going to use what's called a seine net. Two of us will pull this net through the water. It makes a fabric wall. It has a float line and a lead line. And this wall will hopefully trap any organisms that are swimming around so that we can land it on the beach. Uh, Alan and I are now gonna give it a shot. animals we caught in the net. We have six different species. I've selected the largest individuals of each and we're going to measure them now. So I'm going to tell you their common name but on the, the data sheet you'll see that it's going to be the scientific name so you've got to translate. So this one has a couple of names. 
It is the silver side. If you use it for bait, it's often called a shiner. This is the biggest one. Now I'm going to start from the 100 millimeters because I don't want to go to the edge of the ruler. So even though this says 220, I'm going to count that as 120. So he's just short of that. It is 118 millimeters. Most of them were significantly smaller, but that was the biggest one. Uh, we have another fish I'll get to, but I want to show you the invertebrates. We have two different species of shrimp. This one is the grass shrimp. It has a serrated knife-like rostrum or nose. It measures 40 millimeters, and it has long antennae that stick out in front of it, and little tiny claws for feeding. The other kind of shrimp is the shore shrimp, and it stays on the bottom. It doesn't swim through the water. It does not have a long nose. It has tinier claws, and it actually is really good at burying into the sediment. And it measures 38 millimeters long. We captured two crabs. This one is a really small, very young blue crab, sometimes called a blue claw crab. This is the crab that is the Long Island, in fact, the northeast or Atlantic coast eating crab. This is the one that we eat when we have crab cakes or any of the crab foods. Not at this size, of course. They have to be a lot bigger than this. So I'm going to measure the carapace width, not including the legs, because they move their legs all over. So I'm just going to count the carapace. It is 11 millimeters from end to end. The other one looks similar. I don't know how well you're going to be able to zoom in on this. This is a mud crab. Mud crabs are a native, small, rocky shoreline animal. It lives in the seaweed. And the way you can tell them apart from other crabs is they have little chocolate colored tips to their claws. Again, I'll do carapace width. Zeroing in on that 100, he is 13 millimeters wide. Okay, I've gotten the last fish. It is another what we call young of the year, um, sometimes abbreviated YOY. Why oh why is this so fast? Um, this is a common shoreline fish. I have them upside down for you. This is the mummachog. This is a young of the year, so it's about as small as we ever catch them. It is 31 millimeters long. These are very hardy fish that live in the shoreline areas between the grasses on sandy beaches. They actually change their color from a really pale tan to darker colors. When they uh, get into breeding colors in midsummer, they have really vibrant electric blue. Uh, really fun fish and very tolerant of salt changes, of temperature changes. One of the toughest fish around. Don't just go for sharks and the big guys. Killifish have it. Okay, for those of you who have worked with us for the last four weeks, this is my favorite part. This is the habitat survey. And I feel that every year, all the schools are really good at getting that aquatic biodiversity numbers in count. But we can't forget about the animals that live in the air, on the land, and also the plants, which Ron's gonna go over in a little bit. But the minute we get here, I start looking, oh my gosh, what's going on? What do I see? So first off, this is kind of, uh, uh, I don't want to say sad, but there was a raccoon. You might say, well, what was a raccoon doing there? Well, it was, as we like to say, expired or deceased, but it was over there. So we are going to count that as our biodiversity. And we also saw over the last couple hours starlings, which is a pretty invasive species of bird here. Lots of gulls. Now, as you know, there is no such thing as a seagull. That's not a species of gull. It's a generalization of the many gulls that live by the sea. So we did see a variety of species, including a herring gull, a ringbill gull, and also a laughing gull. We heard them. We saw two mute swans. I think they're still here. It was a male and a female. They, they were, they were a, a team. Uh, cormorants. We've seen over 10 cormorants. We see them almost every location. 
Um, and we also have uh, spotted yellow jackets because, of course, they're under the, the pier that we're working at. But what's interesting about the site is last year we had binoculars and we came with a great birder and we saw two bald eagles and the osprey were still here. Now now the osprey have um, flown south for the winter, but you can see that their pole in their nest still exists. And that's the nest that they'll return to every year. And that over there is where we saw the bald eagles. And that's the William Floyd estate where we believe that they have nests there. We're gonna take a walk through this little section of the marsh right here. It's off the corner of the parking area that we've been working. It's maybe 100 feet from where we did all of the sampling. As we walk, I'm going to tell you the names of some of these plants. Salt marshes are super interesting in that most of the plants we're familiar with in forests can't grow here. They're inundated by salt water periodically. There are storms that come through. There is wind that brings salt. So taller trees would have the salt hit the leaves and they would die. So as we walk down this path, I'm going to point out some of the plants that are adapted to this habitat. One of the first ones is this shrub right here. This is not one of them. This is a non-native shrub called autumn olive or Russian olive. It actually has tiny little olives on it right now because we're in the autumn when it produces fruit. Uh, this is an invasive that is noted by its shiny underside to the leaves. That's one way you can't mistake it. This sort of sheen, the silvery shine to the underside of the leaves. Non-native autumn olive. Tough plant, that's why it's invasive. It can adapt to a lot of different habitats. We have a lot of grasses here. This is still pretty high up, uh, away from the salt water. So we see ragweed, mugwort, and a couple of other non-native classic waste area uh, sort of weeds. But mixing in with them, we see the ever popular red leaves in groups of three, the poison ivy. This area here has poison ivy that's growing up sort of as a low shrub. Uh, some of it might vine up a bit. Uh, everyone knows the leaves of three, let it be. Poison ivy has an oil on all parts of the plant, leaves, stems, roots. Uh, the chemical that it produces is called arushiol, and humans are allergic to it, at least most people. If you not allergic to it, don't expose yourself because you build up a susceptibility to it. You know, you'll lose your ability to not get poison ivy rashes. Coming through here, we're starting to reach the salt marsh proper. The grasses are now the, not the non-native grasses, but some of the Spartina grass, the Phragmites and the Disticlus grass that are the three combination plants that you see in the salt marsh. This shrub now is a native. It is a high salt marsh plant called bayberry. Bayberry is uh, very waxy leaves so that it, it has a reduced uh, evapotranspiration. It doesn't dry out. It doesn't wilt. Uh, even though it's in a very quick, sandy, draining soil, it can survive and tolerate this sort of habitat. Bayberry smell from old bayberry candles was actually originally used. Uh, the plant was originally used for that odor. Now it's all artificial. More bayberry. We see some red cedar, another tolerant plant. The red cedar can become a tree, but in a habitat like this, it's probably doomed to be a shrub that eventually dies out. Red cedars are also called pioneer cedars because they adapt to a disturbed area and then allow the soil to sort of get grabbed and uh, the secondary succession continues. This time of year, you're gonna notice this in the salt marsh. This is goldenrod. And from the waxy thickness of the leaves, I'm going to say that this is probably the seaside goldenrod. Uh, this is again adapted to salt and we're very close to the beach. And here we are. The last plant I want to show you is just in the marsh. You can see the thickness of the marsh and the differences in the grasses.
there are zones, micro zones of growth where the wind waves and salt changes what's best adapted. So this grass likes the real close to the shore. Then you go into this one where it drops down slightly. And then you go into these grasses and shrubs behind it. Each one is just a slight change in elevation off the high tide line. And it makes it so this spot is for this grass and this spot is for this grass. The last plant I want to show you is this one. It's uh, just here in the high part of this zone and it's uh, sort of like a succulent. This is uh, called Salicornia uh, glasswort. The other nickname for it is salt marsh pickle. It isn't edible, although I don't recommend you eat any plants, even if I tell you to. Uh, it has that salt in it. It's able to tolerate it, so it has that sort of pickly kind of taste to it. I particularly don't like it. For me, it's like eating salt water. But there you have it, the salt marsh. You've just taken a walk through. Now we're going to talk about the water temperature. This is very important because it'll determine what biodiversity and species live in the water and also will give us some really good feedback on the water chemistry that we have collected. So as we can see, we're at about 17 degrees Celsius and you could figure out the rest to determine the Fahrenheit. So hello everybody. So we are now on section group four where we're looking at the chemistry of the river. It tells a little bit about the health of the river that we're looking today at the forge. So the first test that we did, we looked at was the oxygen levels. It's called dissolved oxygen. So take a little bit of milliliters of water in this tube and we put in two tablets of the uh, sample. And it's a colorimetry reactor, so the change of color is an indicator that tells you about how much oxygen you have. If we take our sample and we put it against our colorimetric chart, we can see that it's about eight parts per million. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good number of oxygen levels in the river. Our next, next test is the pH. It tells us about how acidic or how basic our water is. And we're going to show that to you. So we're going to take our river water and we are going to add 10 milliliters of the water sample. And we're doing that and we are being carefully measuring with that dropper. And the tube that we're using today has a marked line that tell us where the 10 milliliter mark is. And we're going to look at the meniscus. So the lower part of that meniscus will tell us that we actually accurately measured at about 10 milliliters of our river water. Again, it's a color change. So we are going to add one tablet. And we're gonna be very careful that we do not touch the tablet with our bare hands. And we're going, uh, we're going to like cap it, and we're going to mix it. Okay, very quick mix. Again, it's a color change, and depending of the different color range, it tells whether our river is how the pH, whether it is very acidic or very basic. And for a few minutes, and this is, looks pretty good actually. So. pretty well dissolved and if we take our water sample and against our color chart it's actually about seven our pH of our water is about seven which means it's neutral the next next test that we did was the phosphate levels again we took about 10 milliliters of the river water and put our water our tablet chemical tablet sample and when we compare that against our color chart we have about four, about four parts per million phosphate in our water. Our last test is the nitrate test. The nitrate test, as you notice, that we have to cover, we put it in a little uh, aluminum bag. And the reason we do this is because this test is very sensitive for ultraviolet light, the light that comes from the sun. So we have to cover so our chemicals do not degrade. 
when we take it out. Again, we put it against our color chart. And because the limit of our detection is about five parts per million, this is how we're gonna call it. We're gonna call it about five parts per million because that's the lowest number we can actually accurate measure. We did all this test. We're done in duplicates. Okay. And we do this test more than once because the more data that we gather, the more accurate our, our results will be. Yeah, hi, we're going to measure turbidity, which is a measure of water clarity. So the more particles in the water, the higher the turbidity. The less particles, the clearer the water becomes, the lower the, the turbidity. This is called a long sight tube. Uh, it's granulated with numbers along the edge. And on the bottom, there's a black and white circle. When I can see the circle, it indicates the turbidity of the water. So at the moment, the water is at one meter, 100 centimeters. So my colleague is going to slowly release the water. And when I see the seeky disc, stop, which is now at 99 centimeters. So the difference is one centimeter. I can now see the um, seeky disc. We're going to be doing this three times, three different locations to get an understanding of the turbidity up and down the Forge River. One of the characteristics of river water and ocean water that's really important for the kind of life that lives there is the salinity. And depending on whether the tide is coming in, coming out, whether it's an estuary environment or an open ocean environment, the salinity can vary. There are several ways to measure salinity. One of the ways is by doing specific gravity. Another way is by using an instrument called the refractometer. This works on the principle that the refractive index of salt water is different than the refractive index of fresh water. And so what you do is you put a sample on this little screen right here, close the cover, and look through the eyepiece. And when you look through the eyepiece, you'll see a scale. Now when you put distilled water on here first to calibrate this, <coughs> The, the scale should read zero. And then once we're ready to actually test the salinity, we'll take a sample with our drop of water that we've collected, put it on the screen, here, close the cover, give it a second, look up, and we'll see that the, there's a blue screen and a white screen. And the interface where the blue screen meets the white screen is where you read the salinity. This is specific gravity in this point. That's 1.015. And that can convert to salinity. <clears throat> if we think there's a problem with the readings, we can take this little cover off and we have a screwdriver that we can calibrate this. This is a very simple way of doing this. All right, we've had a great day today doing all four of our groups. And we'd rather have you here visiting you, seeing your students and you getting out there and doing this hands-on investigating. But we really have appreciated being in your shoes this year and really seeing how you do what you do and what you do and how much fun this is. So we're hoping that you can use this data that we've collected for you in your classroom. We did collect data, but we didn't do all of the formulas. So you could do it as well. And also, some teachers will also be bringing other water, uh, water samples into the classroom so you can experiment and you could compare and contrast those as well. So thank you for being here, and we hope to see you in person next year.